Good evening. Uh, maybe I should say salam alaikum. Well, uh, Dr. Mustafa asked me to, to speak about natural substances against neglected tropical diseases. And uh, it could be a, a nice book, speaking of one illness and then drugs, one illness, the drugs, one illness, the drug. Five or ten minutes later, you will, you will be asleep. So I, I, I will change things just to see you interesting things. Uh, this one. Uh, ah, this one. You know, uh, neglected disease, we are going to define what is it exactly, but just to see, we are going to speak about ailments, worms, uh, which can be everywhere. Here you have larvae of ailments in a drop of water, and that will be eaten by a, a, a sheep, and we will speak, we'll take five minutes to speak about leishmaniasis, which is one of my uh, subjects. So, uh, maybe more than one billion people worldwide suffer from at least one of the 17 life-threatening diseases currently, current, currently classified by WHO and by MSF, which means Médecins Sans Frontières, without frontiers, medical doctors, as neglected tropical diseases. They are a major cause of morbidity, disability, and not all of them, but the majority of them, of mortality in tropical regions. Neglected. Neglected why? Why? Because everybody look uh, in another direction and ignore this illness, which are very important. And peculiarly, the people who are able to finance, to, to give some money. So neglected is due to the lack of financial investment into research, we are trying to change that and development of new drug and also of non-existent public awareness in high-income countries. When you're speaking with a man coming from the United States or from France, of course, you tell him, uh, do you know anything about sleeping sickness? Well, it has disappeared years and years ago. No, uh, sleeping sickness has not disappeared. We used to say that in uh, the place where neglected tropi tropical disease prevail, malaria can also be considered as a neglected disease. Why? And uh, what are these 17? I will say 17 a lot, a, very, very often. What are these 17 illness? Of course, dengue, which is a viral origin rabies, protozoa uh, illness with chagas, sleeping sickness, and leishmaniasis, some uh, illness due to uh, bacteria, and of course, in tropical region where it's wet, warm, uh, helmet illness with all of that. We are only going to speak, we are going to speak only of soil transmitted helmentiasis. If you want to learn more, you can go to this site, website, which, uh, where DNDI means Drug for Neglected Disease Initiative, which is, a, which is a group founded by WHO who work on that and who try to help in working with on, on neglected diseases. Uh, this illness have long time been associated with poor socioeconomic and poor hygienic circumstances. So they also could be termed disease of neglected populations. When your government don't look after you, you are neglected by your government. It's, it's better to buy an aircraft, a military aircraft, than to help people. It's about the same price. Uh, some success have been reported mainly by vector control. But today, more than one billion people suffer from more than one of these illness. Of course, you have, for some of these illness, pharmacotherapies, mainly in case of protozoan proto uh, illness. But most of these drugs have a high degree of toxicity and lateral or unwanted effects when you, for example, use uh, 
Amphotericin B, I'm not sure of my pronunciation, Amphotericin B against Leishmaniasis. If you cure Leishmania, you can also uh, break the kidneys of the patient. Well, uh, sorry. These drugs are hard to find, and of course, we have spoken about that for malaria, but it's true for the others. The emergence of resistant pathogens will diminish the efficiency of the drugs. So, that, that will be my speech mainly. The search for new chemical entities showing activity against neglected tropical disease pathogens is a very important field of research. I think you may not agree with me. Uh, we are going now to speak about anthelmintic, about ailments first, and I will try to explain you why we should search for new drugs against ailments. Soil transmitted ailments mainly. You know, when you are a small baby and you play in the garden of mummy, you can eat earth, uh, ground, soil, and you can be ill. But it can happen in that sort of circumstances also. And you can add also here zoonosis uh, and things like that. Well, why? Why should we find or fight against, sorry, fight against uh, neglected disease? Uh, you have five illness here, and you have here the number of people in million, of course, which are infected. Geoment, soil transmitted ailments, more than one billion. It's not a very important illness because you can support it, but it's important in terms of development of intellectual development. There is a very nice study which has been led in Kenya where in two or three schools they gave anthelmintic drugs and in two or three other schools they didn't give uh, anthelmintic drugs. And they look after the development. Well, the intellectual development was quasi similar but where the people were treated, where the children were treated, the acquisition of basis level in the school was faster. I hope I'm clear. So, a lot of people are concerned, and you have here what is called DALIS for Disability Adjusted, Adjusted Life Year. I'm sorry for the French, and I think you have French here, so up, take it off. <laughs> Let's say that is the loss of life of comfortable life due to this illness in a normal life. See? Uh, for illnesses that concern so many people, you have here the number of international programs to fight against this illness. Okay? And the duration of this program. For example, the eradication of oncosarcosis began in 1974 and it should have been finished in, two, in 2002. It has not finished, so in 1995 they say, let's make 30 years more. It's hard to eradicate, we will see why. Some other illness have programmed to, to control them. So take of the French, sorry. Just here to see the uh, geographical repartition of this illness and particularly the distribution of this disease in many countries where you can have one, two, three, four of this illness in, here in the blue. You have uh, schistosomiasis, uh, well, uh, you have here, uh, what is it exactly? Oncocercosis, and, and well, four at least neglected disease. Here in Indonesia, we have uh, soil transmitted elements, schistosomiasis, and LF, I don't remember, lymphatic filariasis. Sorry, I'm a bit tired. So, you know, it concerns a lot of people, as you can see. And of course, the tropical and intertropical countries. Ah, it's here. You have the explanation, sorry. Uh, among this illness, let's have a glance on the responsible. And for example, you can find, we will find things about Ascaris, about Tricuris. Come on, come on. About Necator here, 
Strangiloides, Sacralis, Anterobius, Vermiculis, and I don't think I have any picture, but you have here illnesses transmitted as zoonosis. The name of this illness, and here, which is more interesting, the number of infected people. And as you can see, it's very uh, precise. From 807 to 1,221. We don't know exactly how many people are concerned because you have no survey or very little survey concerning people who have this illness. Pinworm, depending on the countries and of the papers, of course, it goes from 4 to 28 percent of the children in the age between the age of one, uh, no, between the age of two to ten, I think. Okay, so you can see again that these are not uh, in existing illness. Uh, here, just to see you uh, the species again, the, the size of the worms, the number of eggs produced every day, the localization here, DGI means Judenum, Judenum ileum, and the life duration of these animals. Tricuris, less eggs, longer life. Uh, Necator, which is well, uh, longer, very longer life, and Ankylostoma, very longer life. When you know that every uh, female of Necator eats about 100 microliters to 300 microliters of blood a day, you can calculate how many blood, oh, sorry, how many blood they eat every day, every, during your life, sorry. Uh, Fighting against soil transmitted elements uh, has been, should be instilled by uh, WHO, but I'm not sure it works so well. It has been done so well. And you have here the place, the proportion of children between 1 to 14 year school age in the country that should recur preventive chemotherapy for some soil transmitted elementiasis. Okay? You see. The, the number here and once again this country needs a very uh, important mass treatment that is that should be uh, the goal of a lot of government of, and of international countries to fight against this illness just to see a few pictures you have here pinworm, and it doesn't work. Oh, I'm sorry, I wanted it to work, but it doesn't work. Could you try to, to have it working? Uh, the other, uh, this one, anterobius. Yes, sometimes some, well, you can see that these animals are really alive in your uh, digestive tract. Of course, it's not the way to make the diagnosis. <laughs> that is because this man was, uh, they make him, uh, uh, and you can have more, okay? Only, not only one female, a lot of female. Okay, we can stop, I think. The other one will be longer. Thank you very much. You're very efficient, thank you very much. Well, just to see how it works, uh, you know maybe pinworm, you ingest the egg, it develops in the digestive tract as a larva, and then the larva become adult. They copulate, and the women, the women, I'm sorry, the female uh, goes down, and uh, she produces her eggs just at the end of the digestive tract. The eggs are either rejected outside or put on fingers and ate. Hookworms, you may know this one. You are, penit you are uh, walking in a wet country, like a rice field, for example, or uh, a sewer, and the lava can, penet can uh, penetrate skin and then migrates and develop. So, oops, I'm sorry. Lava migration inside the body and anemia determined by adult worms, these two events are heavy for the, the patient. 
another one you may know. And I wanted to show this one, Ascaris lumicoides, because the eggs that are outside in the soil contaminate the soil, and that soil is contaminated for about two to five years. The duration of these eggs in the soil is very long, and it's very hard to uh, disinfect the soil. Uh, wait, one thing uh, which is important too, uh, this worm, when they are sufficient, in sufficient number, determine currencies in protein and glucids, and they uh, are heavy, and they diminish the intensity of the immune response when the children are vaccinated. It's quite important too, so you should conceal to treat before any vaccination. So if we can try to have this one, one of the awful picture. Thank you. Once again, in a digestive tract, somewhere here, inflated with uh, air, you can find sometimes these worms. They move, yeah. But you never know that they move. Huh? When the diagnosis has been done, the people say, oh yes, uh, they move inside, but before they didn't move. Well, uh, we wake up a little because at the end of this one, uh, the man will, uh, the, the medical doctor will kill the animal, you see. Wait a few seconds again. And I, I would like to ask you to, to have a, a little think to this poor animal, which is settled in a digestive tract and which is going to be expulsed, if the word exists, very fast, by the surgeon. Poor little animal. No? Okay. It is not the way to treat ascaridiosis. Okay? You can use uh, drugs. It's very efficient, mo very more efficient. <laughs> Look. I didn't do that. and here in the worm. Okay, thank you very much. Well, and so uh, another one because it, 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 it's interesting because it's close to uh, our animal models. This one is, oops, I'm sorry, up. This one is uh, Strangeoides stercoralis and once again there is a transcontinuous penetration of lava which migrate and then uh, in the digestive tract the parasite is settled in as a pathogenetic female and she uh, produces eggs which can uh, give very fast a larva and this larva can be infective and you have an inside cycle it can, if the conditions outside are not nice very fast, uh, it, it's, it, it has been evacuated here, of course, and we are outside when the red, uh, the red flesh, come on. With the red arrow, it is when you are outside. This larva uh, transforms very fast in infective larva, and if the outside conditions are not so nice, that goes very fast, two to eight days. And when the outside conditions are good, these larvae become adults and amplified. And once again, they, oops, where is it? They pollute the soil with that. And the soil is contaminated. Okay, three cycles. And this is very close to one of the models we use to evaluate the activity of antelmantic, of potentially antelmantic drugs. I have c cited this, this one, but I don't work at all on uh, Filaria, Mushiaria bancrofti, just to see that soil transmitted elements are important, but you have other elements, and this one is transmitted by uh, the bite of a mosquito, Colex aedes anopheles or mansonia, and the mosquito. Uh, and the human being keep and the, um, are a reservoir of the parasites. You may know that because you have some, I think, in, in, um, 
in uh, Indonesia, they all sleep. So, you can see that I've shown you a few elements, a few worms, and what, what could be said is that you need, we need to treat. But the problem when you treat everybody, when you use mass treatment, can be linked to a misuse of misusage, misuse, misuse I think, of, of the drugs. And we have few lessons to uh, learn from uh, the vet medicine. One of the more important lessons is the resistance. If you, if you treat all the population, you see the apparition of resistance. Between, for example, 2000 and 2006, for three categories of anthelmintic in uh, parasites of goat and or sheep, or sheep, sorry, uh, the resistance uh, appeared here, not for this category, but for this category, levamisole uh, and morantel, which, which are uh, antelmantic drugs. It was the same for avermectin milbemicin, which was the last usable against this parasite, and it is the same here with the last drug usable. So you see, Concerning this three element, mass treatment used by vet surgeon led to the inefficiency of most of the drug available. If mass treatment is initiated, resistance should occur by the same, by the same reason. Hmm? This mass treatment uh, is a goal of the uh, WHO and want to treat at least 75% of school age children. Okay. I said here former WHO objective because it has been uh, delayed in the time. This eye drug pressure led to resistance and you can see here that uh, it was in, 19, in 20, uh, 2012 and 2014 that uh, numerous anthelmintic drugs have lost their efficiency. Here, for example, Levamectin against tri tricocephals, tricocephals, no, Whipram, sorry, has lose a lot of its of of effect. Same thing for Ascaris and Pirantel and so on. So mass treatment led to resistance mechanically. That's what one of the speakers said a few minutes before me. Other cause of, uh, of uh, resistance, of course, uh, the wrong use, which led to low doses and bad observance, and counterfeit drugs, which are illustrated here. It's not in, in Indonesia. Uh, no counterfeit drug in Indonesia. It's in Africa. Uh, I'm sorry for the French, but it's interesting. Uh, Leonardo Basco, I've written in uh, 2004 that uh, on the million people who die from malaria, maybe 200,000 could be saved if they use the right drugs. So at least these people use these drugs and they were not cured for their malaria crisis. Uh, so why? Because you have a uh, few drugs. Have you seen just before? Where is it? Where it was? It was here. You have a few available, available drugs for uh, soil transmitted elements, a low number. The risk of emergence of resistance. The art drug availability, new drugs would not be more available anyway. And these uh, drugs, if coming from natural substance, will help in biodiversity valorization, and in that case, in the protection of this biodiversity. However, uh, what could be convenient source as uh, what could be a, a convenient source of natural drug? You can use random screening. That what did Merck Sharpendom in 1970s, and they obtained on 200,000 substances tested. I think they obtained the ivermectin. 
well, a success, but very expensive. You can use uh, what they call signature theory. You know, when you have ascaris, your breath is smells allium, uh, garlic. So in uh, in um, Caribbean Sea, when your breath is full of garlic, they give you allium sativum, garlic, to kill the parasites. It doesn't work. You can also use ethnopharmacology as a source of uh, drug efficient. It's quite efficient. Another question it is, what are the best experimental models? It's not easy to test drug against helminths in uh, man, because you don't know if it's efficient or not. And you have a certain host specificity. So you need to have one, two, maybe three models to be sure that it is efficient before any test on the, on the man. But this is true for other drugs, of course. And, and for what purpose? To find new active principle, of course. Maybe to create, to create what we can call improved traditional medicines and maybe to evidence new targets because as for malaria, when, you resist, when an element is resistant to a category of drugs, uh, all the active of the de de derived molecules lose their efficiency. Just one example what, of what we've done in the, in the lab. We have worked on these two plants, which are Zantoxylum, Zantoxyloides, and Newboldia Leavis, which are medicinal plants used by uh, traditional healers in Benin, in Africa, for the treatment of small remnants nematode infection. They do not make the diagnosis. The young sheep and the young goats are weak. They have, uh, their mucosus is clear, white, so they say they are ill and they use that. But the helminths we, who contaminate the goat and sheep are hematophages, are, eat blood. That's why mucosis are white. And these, uh, these healers say also that this, this plant sorry, are efficient against worm in human. Well, what we do, we developed uh, some models and Trichostrongidus colibriformis and Emoncus contortus, which are worms of uh, young, of small ruminants. We worked on a model on, uh, used in the rat, which is Strongyloides hati. We worked on the egg hatching. I cannot pronounce that word. Uh, in French, it's dégainement. Uh, it's really easier for me. So let's say ex treatment of such infective larva. The, the, the larva is in a strong cuticle and it has to go out of this cuticle to become infective. That is that word. And we have also worked on, on uh, Strongyloides cercoralis, migration of the larva, in order to, to confirm the efficiency of this model. Uh, these drugs, these plants, sorry, were, um, I'm sorry for the French here, have been, uh, very f some chemical groups have been purified in these plants, and you have here the extraction yields, and you can see here that some of them work, work quite well, at least as do the levamizole in some models, and with a log of difference, with triabendazole in other models. Triabendazole and levamizole are the control. So we confirm here the results of the ethnopharmacological survey. We are, fractionating, we are fractionating the alkaloids, and I will not say anything more to you. And uh, we found a similar activity on human worm, Strongyloides stercoralis. So it's only one example to show that uh, some, um, some data obtained from ethnopharmacology can lead to something which could be interesting. I have some time left. Yes? I don't know. Well, how many times? How long? Five minutes? Six? Well, let's try. After soil transmitted element, a few words again uh, about leishmaniasis. You may have heard about this illness. It can be a cutaneous or a visceral illness. This, most of the time, is not so uh, important. This, without any treatment, lead uh, to the death of the patient. 
uh, help. Uh, you have here the stage which is, tra which is transmitted by mosquitoes, by small mos mosquitoes, sunfly, which is called pro mastigot. And you have here in uh, bone marrow uh, examination the parasite here, here in monocytes. And this form is called a mastigot because it has no uh, flagellum. flagellum. Well, sh why should we search drugs against Leishmania? Because it concerns 350 million people in 82 countries. 12, pe 12 million people suffer from this illness. And 1 to 2 million new cases a year. And about 500,000 new cases of visceral leishmaniasis, which without treatment are constantly lethal. The treatments, that's what I told you in the introduction, on Photoricin B, you may know, but it has a high renal toxicity. Liposomal and Photoricin B, the same molecule with a galenic preparation, quite different. It has a high financial toxicity. Here, the treatment costs about one euro a day. Here, the treatment is about 300 euro a day. I don't know how many in, in Rupia. You make, make the calculation. So, uh, you cannot use that in neglected zones. Antimonial derivative and pentacarina pentamidine have numerous side effects. Antimonial, you can kill your mother-in-law if you want with that. It's very efficient. It's, the, the, the security index between uh, efficiency and toxicity is very narrow. And miltefosin, which is a promising drug, which has been uh, developed as an anti-Leishmania drug, has been retracted for, uh, from from the use because it, at the beginning it was an anti-cancer drug and it was too toxic to make an anti-cancer drug and it's now an anti-Leishmania drug. And of course, resistance are spreading. Leishmania major and Leishmania infantum, which are the two agents of visceral leishmaniasis, are now, some of them, not at all of course, resistant to antimonial and some of them to amphotericin B, at least in the laboratory. Well, just to say that the target are here, the monocytes where the parasites uh, multiply, which explode and then it keep on. Here, the sunfly, we can forget it for the moment. Three targets are usable. Of course, the promastigot, which is here, which is in the um, sunfly. You have then here the amastigot, which is normally in a monocyte, macrophage, but which can be cultivated freely in an axionic way. This is the second target. And the third target is the macrophage with, here, or without, maybe here, a parasite in. Okay? The promastigot is not really convenient for drug testing because we don't want to cure the sunfly. We try to cure the human. So if a drug is efficient on that, we are not sure that it is efficient on that on or that. But it is very easy to expand and to maintain in vitro. That's why many studies concerning natural substance were made on promastigot. The amastigot is really convenient uh, but it's hard to expand in vitro in an axionic way. You can cultivate cells and have, have um, amastigot in, but to have it like that, it's not so easy. It's possible, anyway. And these amastigot, axionic, have been uh, transfected with GFP or luciferase genes. And the macrophage here, macrophage here, is, of course, free from parasites, useful for toxicity studies. When it is parasitized, it's hard to distinguish between macrophage death due to the drug you test or parasite death. You have two uh, people here. Everybody died. Is it because the macrophage died or because the parasite died? We don't know. Just to illustrate my, my speech, we tested two plants here, Helichrysum gymnocephalum, as an extract. And you see that it was active on promastigot. 
moderately, well, compared with uh, amphotericin B, who is a control here, moderately active on promastigot, moderately active on amastigot, uh, mm, 0.064. Very toxic. These are uh, mm, 50% inhibitory concentration in microgram. I'm sorry, um, something is missing. And the lower the value here, the more toxic is the drug. So this extract was quite efficient, but very toxic. So we didn't test that. And another drug was not really efficient on promastigot, very efficient on amastigot. It was not so toxic, you see. And we tested uh, on macrophage with amastigot, and clearly uh, it is interesting. We stop here because the alkaloid is... Uh, has to be ident identified. So, to conclude, I should say that we have a lot of, I showed you three or four plants. You have a million plants that can be sources of potentially uh, secondary metabolites which, uh, are, which could be active. Provenings from terrestrial plants, from bacteria, from, from, from fungi, and from marine uh, origin now because we go to see alga and things like that. So we have an immense diversity of uh, secondary metabolites that can be characterized as future drugs. But uh, these drugs can cost, uh, can cost some money of course, but they also can be modified by uh, synthetic chemistry. All of these and the fact, that, the fact that these illness are always important, uh, maybe we'll give one or two chains to biodiversity, whatever is its origin, and this biodiversity will be protected if we can find some drug with it. Prima Thank you.